G'day, I'm here with my mate Bob from Adelaide. Uh, we've come down to see St. Columba Falls. Uh, it's trying to rain a little bit, it's not too bad. Say g'day, Bob. How you going, buddy? Bob and I have been friends for 49 years, and I'm 54, so that's that's a pretty well long life commitment there. So we're going down to see the waterfall. His wife and daughter's with us, and we're going to uh, check out some of the sights in this beautiful yeah. forest. Yeah. is looking good, starting to get flowers on it now, it's starting to get buds. Soon the pickers will come in, they'll harvest it, pile it all up, turn it into uh, compost. Here comes the warrior Jess who's limping a bit, she's cleaned something up, got an injury, she's going to go to the vets and get checked out. She's doing alright. Anyway, good morning. I've done a lot of interviews over the years. I've spoken to hundreds of people about their experiences and their sightings. A lot of them from the mainland, some of them from Tassie. Um, people from all walks of life, obviously, and, you know, random as, because it is a random thing to see a thylacine or something else that's unusual and bit cryptid. Um, but this story, this story is an excellent story. Uh, I thoroughly believe the lady is telling me the truth about what she was told. It wasn't her actual experience, but she was good friends with the people who had the experience. It's actually two sightings and a bit of information about the area um, where it was happening back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I do believe the story. It's an excellent uh, encount, account of uh, what happened. Um, she's remembered it pretty well, so yeah, I hope you enjoy it. I certainly do. It's, it's compelling stuff because, you know, they're obviously worth still thylacines on the mainland um, after white settlement, and there still is. So, you know, science can be in denial about that as much as they like, but until they properly investigate it, they're always going to be sitting on the nay side, aren't they? Never mind. Here's the story. Hope you enjoy it. I haven't actually had the uh, honour of seeing old Stripey myself, but... Um I have had a panther sighting. Yeah, okay. Uh, up near Cad River, uh, we were going up to the Olympic Games in Sydney, and it was just the far side of Cad River. It wouldn't have been five minutes outside of Cad River, about midnight, and um, there was a large black cat, and I mean German shepherd-sized, feeding on roadkill, and it simply leapt off the side of the road and as soon as we passed it came back again yeah okay so it wasn't that scared off by his no i would say it quite possibly was used to um having a bit of scavenging a bit of uh, a snack from roadkill yeah and it would just move when it saw cars and come back again when they'd gone because at that hour of the night even though it was the princess highway uh, there wouldn't have been that much traffic around yeah yeah Okay, so I'm recording now. It's all working. Okay. So um, thank you so much for coming forward with your information. I love it when I hear some of these really good, detailed, you know, historic sightings where there was multiple witnesses and 
and you know quite a substantial amount of information and and when you I got your email I was blown away with some of the the detail that was in there so um let's hear it in in words in in your own words let's hear what happened exactly there's I know there's a couple of incidents isn't there yes there is they're both in the, in the 1970s one was in the the late 70s, I'm sort of thinking probably 78, 79. I don't know what time of year it was. I do know that my school friend Alison had um, been in the Gippsland town of Terrelgan with her father at a Lions Club meeting. Right. And they were coming back home. It would have been getting close to midnight. And as they came into Rosedale from the Terrelgan side and slowed for the 80k side, um, they saw an animal sitting in the middle of the road that at first they thought was a dog. And then when it got up, and they had to slow right down. In fact, I think um, Alison's dad had to actually stop the car at one point to avoid hitting the dog. And when it stood up under the headlights, it was clearly no dog. Right. The shape of the animal was wrong. Again, it was probably roughly German shepherd sized. It had the striping on the hind quarters, the long, stiff tail. Um, it yawned at them with that big, wide mouth open gesture, which I believe is a threat gesture from them. Yeah, that's a, a, definitely a warning to say, get away. Um, yes, it's, it's look at my big mouthful of teeth, I can eat you. Yep. Um, and then it sat on its hind legs and it took a couple of bounding strides similar to a kangaroo but not as long or as high. It then um, ran in a peculiar gate off to the side of the road and they continued on home. And they didn't speak about it for some time. But at the same time, around the Rosedale area in the town, their people's pet dogs were having fights with another animal they were sometimes losing. A lot of towns in, a lot of the houses in the town of Rosedale didn't and don't necessarily have fully fenced yards. So this so thing could plot. roam around as much as it wanted, pretty much? Pretty much. Um, there was scavenging and rubbish bins and things. That could have been dogs too, though. Sure. Um, my, how do I put it? My brother-in-law's father yep. lives between Rosedale and Terralgan and a bit closer to Rosedale than Terralgan. And for a number of years, sort of late 70s to early 80s, there was a large animal which he described as a native animal predating on his sheep. Yep. He didn't give any indication of how the carcasses were left, but it was clear he had seen the creature and knew it wasn't any type of dog, dingo or fox. He didn't... He wouldn't go into it much more than that. So he didn't specify what sort of native animal, but clearly large. Large, carnivorous, big enough to kill sheep. Sure. Fair um, enough. And, you know, there's not many things that are going to do that, except a thylacine. Yeah, well, there, there's other large, There's one other large native predator that is rumoured to not be extinct as well, but we won't go down that rabbit hole today. Um, but... No, well, I, I think I, I discussed that one with you about Connemara Station in our last call. Yeah, um, yeah, you did touch on it. The stockmen were convinced that was what was killing, not full-grown cattle and horses, but certainly up to yearling size. Yeah, yeah, well, there, there's stories about those... Um, sort of attacks in Victoria as well on a lot of the cattle and, and horses oh. and stuff as well. Oh. Yes, yeah, so the other sighting was a hunting party who went out from um, the Mafra district. Yeah, now with this um, one, can you not be too specific about the location? Because I think I've worked out where it, roughly it was actually from looking yes, at the maps. Well, we'll just say that it was in a, a, uh, a forest near, nearish to Sale. Yep. That's perfect. Um, a forest where there was, there was and is a lot of deer. Yeah, and a lot and of blackberries. They, yes, <laughs> and blackberries and many other things. Uh, there's rumoured to be brumbies and all sorts of things in those forests. Yeah, okay. So um, they went out to illegally bow hunt deer. This is in 1974, I believe. Yep. Um, I was first told this story around somebody's kitchen table. What year um, did you learn the story? Pardon? What year did you find out about it? I would 
been 20 years later in the, the early to mid 90s. Okay, no worries, go on. And I was first told that they wounded a deer and were attacked by a strange animal, that was it. And the person whose kitchen table I was sitting at was the brother-in-law that went back with one of the hunters the following morning. Okay, yep. When everybody else had left um, and it was just me, him and his wife, he filled in the extra details. Okay. Um, that they'd gone hunting, that they had found and wounded a um, stag and as they shot it, a creature they'd never seen the likes of came out of the, the blackberries and stood them up over the deer carcass or the wounded deer. These two hunters really got a fright. The wife of one of them fled with the fearless hunting dog sooner back to the vehicle and locked themselves in. And um, the animal followed them. Pres presumably it was most threatened, I would think, by the dog. Yeah, okay. So Not the people. So it followed the dog back to the car with the lady who I said we called R. Yes. And R and the dog are cowering in the car with the, with the windows up and the doors locked and the animals scratching at the doors and windows, snarling, as I said in the email, climbed up onto the bonnet and um, attacked and possibly chewed right off the windscreen wipers, those sorts of things. Was very angry and upset. Everyone was probably pretty pretty freaked out by all that at the time no doubt but a tense moment yeah and um the description again was pretty clear clearly that of thylacine yep um the striping across the hind quarters the fact that it was it was not a dog fox or or um dingo but both men particularly the guy that uh, eventually took a shot at this animal had hunted extensively and the um, bow hunter who shot the animal, as I said in my um, uh, email, email, had yeah. hunted in, uh, all over Australia, New Zealand and even Africa and up into Asia as well. Yep. He'd never seen anything like it. They said the noise it made was horrific and they'd never heard anything like it before either. Um, so they eventually take a shot at the animal which is wounded and it runs back into the blackberries okay so and they hit at it. that time they became aware there was another one there and they brought time to leave yep because this animal was also behaving in an extremely aggressive manner growling and um doing that wide open mouth plate and so they they packed up and went home okay and so one of the bow hunters collected his uh brother-in-law the next morning out they went. They found the wounded deer and dispatched it. Um, the wounded, the, the uh, thylacine they wounded the night before appeared and um, he was very badly injured, virtually dragging his hind legs. He brought a female and some uh, young thylacine in with her and they shot the uh, old male too because they felt it would be cruel to let him suffer. Yep. Um, they didn't want anybody disturbing the thylacine, so they didn't bother <clears throat> collecting the body for scientific examination, and they left the deer where it fell, thinking it would give the mother and baby thylacine some food. Yep. I think there were three young, from what I was told. Okay, cool. Oh. Um, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was about to say, so this, this guy, this friend of mine, in the last months of his life when he knew he was dying from a brain tumour, decided to investigate a story he'd heard from a good friend of his. And while I believe the thylacine had never been extinct on the mainland, uh, this fellow also, um, through, a, through an old school friend whose father had been a fisherman, found evidence of at least one occasion of a fishing boat bringing thylacine into the lake's entrance area from Tasmania. Okay. And he's talking that, you know, he's saying they were on the ship's, uh, they were mentioned in the ship's log, and he found all the proof he thought was needed to say that had happened. Yep. And by the same token, he, he was also a believer that they have never been extinct on the mainland. 
Yep. And that even the people who brought them in didn't believe they were extinct on the mainland, but were basically bringing across some thylacine from Tasmania before they were all shot out, maybe to freshen up the gene pool here. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Hmm. That, that log would be the most critical bit of evidence other than a dead animal that would be needed out there for a lot of the rumours, I suppose, that have never been put to rest because I looked at it from a logistics point of view and to carry those animals on a boat and oh. and keep them from, you know, hurting you and hurting themselves and then, you know, having somewhere to unload them in a dinghy and then oh. row to shore with them. It, logistically, it just didn't seem very feasible in many ways but you know i've never said it didn't happen but i've never seen any evidence to say that it did i guess yeah i guess too um once on a fishing boat's a bit different um they're set up depending on the type of boat to um, have placements for for cages yeah like especially cray pots and stuff yeah exactly and um they probably probably had the animals in cages and then manually loaded them on and off the boat. Yeah. Um, at a dock, yeah. Yep. And then they could have been put into a vehicle or even in those days into a buggy or um, horse-drawn vehicle of some kind. And once you're in the Lakes Entrance area, it's not far to a good area of bush you could let them out in. Yeah, there's plenty of good habitat there. You, you could do it on the beach, literally. Yeah, well, you probably could too, but... Yeah. Um, so that that he seemed satisfied that that had actually happened. Yep. And with both sightings I've told you about, Neil, the first one, my friend and her father, they had the car only two or three feet um, from, from the animal. The, yeah, and then the hunters, of course, they got up very close and personal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and look, they did examine the dead animal quite closely. Yeah. Uh, they found it was a pouched animal and all the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. Well, the males have got a small pouch around the testes to protect them when they're yes. running through the bush. Oh. Um, well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they've got an awkward gait, um, oh. and they're halfway between hopping and running, and they're not too sure what they're doing from some of the descriptions I get. Um, well, yes, yes. But that that gait is always mentioned by people when they see them in locomotion. It's always an unusual, really weird loping gait. People say almost exactly the same thing every time, totally independent of each other. Yeah, and the other thing too, and I have heard some of your um, YouTube videos, sometimes people say it's almost as if the animal is lame or has yeah, a injured. gait in some way. Yeah, and Paul Day's video from South Australia in 2017, which is in our documentary actually, it you can see it looks like it's lame, but it swaps. It swaps feet over at the back. It's limping with well, the left yes. leg one minute, then it's limping with the right leg. It's not lame, it's, it's peculiar. <laughs> it's just the way they move. Yeah, at certain speeds, they move in a really strange locomotion. When they're walking... They walk like any other animal, but as soon as they start picking up a bit of pace, um, it changes. Well, yes, that's right. And, of course, they can get the, the I'll use the term heel, or they pop right down onto the ground at the back. Yep. And then that would give them a whole different gait to a dog or a cat doing that too. Exactly, yeah. They've, they've definitely got some unusual features about them that which would contribute to that all the time. Because they're physical well, features. Yes. Mm. They're, they're, but we shouldn't expect them to behave like our, um, our dogs and cats. You know, they're not a dog or a cat. Yeah. They're a completely different species of um, animal. Yeah, a lot of the early settlers in Tasmania described them as, as running like a horse. They'd talk about cantering or, or galloping and things like this when they yes. talked about their locomotion. So. You know, those people used horses for everything back in those days, so they understood that terminology quite well because their horse was their tractor, it was everything. Well, that's right, and we're, we're um, horsemen too. We, we breed horses. Okay, yeah. In Gippsland, yeah. Yep. We actually breed the, um, the whalers, the Australian war horses. Oh, yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Bit of history so there. We've, we've made a bit of a study of animal locomotion over the, the years and I sort of, I've looked at some of your videos that, pertain, that purport to be Tasmanian tigers and yes, you can see that peculiar gait sometimes. 
yeah, you can. Robin Nagorka's animal limped with the front foot. Um, and then we had a, a thermal image of one last year that Mick and Mark got in South Australia that was limping with the front foot. Um, and then um, Paul Day's was just classic footage. His, his, his footage. I think Paul Day's footage is the best yet, really, because it was, you know, clear colour and you got about 12, 15 seconds of this thing just running along through the wheat stubble. It was, you know, pretty... Pretty obvious, but anyway, they still said it was a, a blue heel with an injured, injured foot. <laughs> oh, well. You know. Some people, even if a father seen, marched up behind the victim in the backside. Yeah. Deny it was yeah. There. They'd still say it was a spider bite. Uh, yes, yes, they would. <laughs> and I would think it would very clearly not be. Yes, yes, um, with that 100 degree jaw gape. I would not want to be bitten by one, thank you very much. And I can understand why that hunting party, who were only armed on the night with bows and arrows, but went back with high-powered rifles the next morning. Yeah, just to sort they it out. needed to get out of there because a pair of anglers thylacine like that could certainly kill you. Oh, yeah. Make no mistake about it. Any any yeah. animal that's protecting their young will, will, will oh. defend to the death. Well, this is it, but they also felt, too, that the deer they shot and wounded may have been the male's target, and they've also interfered with his hunt, too. Yeah, quite probably. Mm. And clearly the male, the female and the young weren't that far from, from the actual spot where the hunt was going, about to take place. No, it may have been even that the male was sort of driving the deer towards the female and she would have stepped in and dispatched it. Yeah, I do believe they hunt cooperatively like that. Look, I have seen my farm cats hunt cooperatively. Yep. Most species of predatory animals, where they are not solitary, will yep. hunt cooperatively. Yep. Why should thylacines be any different? That's for sure. That's for sure. Oh. Well, look, and the, the, the cubs would have to learn to hunt from mum too. Yeah, and, and they stay with the mother till they're about two, two and a half. They're quite large when they leave mum. That's also normal with some other species of predatory animal, for example, tigers. Yep. Um, the cubs there will stay with mum for up to three years while they're learning to hunt. Yep. Oh. Yeah, no, that's... Uh, look, I really appreciate your information, Gillian, because um, the the entire um, history of it on the mainland has been so whitewashed by science and... Clearly, they've got an agenda with their cloning technologies and they're using the thylacine as the poster child, yeah? Well, I think so, but also that if all of a sudden they say they've cloned thylacines, they can then admit a few years after that that there's thylacines everywhere because we've cloned them and released them. They yeah. don't have to admit they were always there. Well, the, the only trouble I have with that is this whole cloning thing is about owning patented patented living organisms and I'd really hate to see the poor thing fall under that peril once again you know well, it's a yes, freak show waiting to happen thing. but I do think because um, I discussed this at length with a Victorian police officer and he said in the, in the legislation of most states they would be prevented from doing that because it is a legitimate native animal and therefore would have to have the same protections under law as any other native animal. Gen genetically modified organisms fall under a different um, category, category when it comes to that stuff. And they, they've they already made it very obvious in a lot of the videos they've done with these TED Talks and rubbish that um, they uh, want to have a Jurassic Park style zoo. They've already made that very clear. And to, if you just think you just created a carnivore that can rip the heads off of kangaroos... And yet they're going to say, yeah, no worries, you can let that go in the bush. That'll be fine. That'll fix everything. You know? Like, it, well, it's just a yeah. load of rubbish that government would never allow them to release those things. Yeah. Ever. It would be so irresponsible. So there's a lot of... Mix then again, the American government brought wolves back into Yellowstone uh, National Park to control the deer numbers. So yeah, but they're, the they're real they're wolves. wolves. They're not something that came out of a Petri dish, mixed, mixed DNA from a number and a bloody... Dunna, you know, that's that's a real living wolf, you know. I've got no problem with that. We need the carnivores, obviously, you know. Yeah. All right. So, um, I'm just pleased they're still about, that's all. Yeah, so am I. I've seen three. I've heard them about a dozen times. I find their prints all over God's creation. 
I've had... Have you ever sort of felt threatened by one? Uh, the very first time I got followed by one, that spooked me a bit because it was obviously stalking me and stopping and every time I stopped, it stopped. But it was just curiously following me. It wasn't going to attack me. It was just checking me out, basically. Um, well, that, that's okay then. If it had been stalking you for other purposes, you might have been in trouble. Yeah, I, w- I could have been in real trouble. But they're known to stalk and just watch. They're curious, I guess. Well, that's fair enough. You're allowed to look, aren't you? Yeah, well, you know, they're the apex thing in their environment. And when you're in there and you sort of stand over them, that's something they might want to have a say in, I guess. Well, more too, how much of a threat are you to them for space, for competition, for food, or are you a direct threat, as in maybe yeah. you might be going to kill them? Yeah, well, that's it. We've we've had foxes on the mainland that have been torn into three or four pieces and just left there by something. Oh. You know, the predators will take out mid order, middle order predators for sure. Apex predators will. Oh yes, they certainly will. You don't have a lot um, of feral cats where you've got a lot of dingoes, for example, or foxes. Well, that's very true. Although I did see one of my farm cats bite off a big fox the other day. Oh really? Um, yes, um, got its back against a, a large square hay bale and just sort of sat up and into the fox it got with its front feet and teeth. And the, and the and fox, fox realised it had met its match. Few minutes and took off. <laughs> well, that's excellent. All right, well, look, I'm going to have to end it there. I'm sorry, Gillian, because I've got to that's make okay. this phone call. Um, but I really appreciate your time. And, it, and by all means, if you want to ring me back and have another chat, feel free, anytime. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. All right, good work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.